Hey John, uh, it's Eddie Redmayne here and I just wanted to send you this video. Um, I take my hat off to you and how wonderful that you're raising money for this extraordinary cause. Congratulations so far on the um, cycle challenge for multi neuron disease. Fantastic job guys, you really are smashing it. I send lots and lots of love to you, John and Rachel, and uh, just thank you for, for, for today. So uh, keep me posted. I'm here, I'm here for you. And then it's a shuffle forward, and then out you go. So first of all, tell us why you're here, what are you doing here? What's all this a fuss about? Right, well, what the fuss is about, we're in the highest drop zone in the world, in the Himalayas here, and I'm one of the very lucky few that is gonna be jumping from 23,000 foot out of a helicopter. Now, let's say what you did today. Oh, mate, unbelievable. John, how are you, brother? Yeah, good, thanks, Chris, mate. Yourself? Yes. You got a good. J on the wall, is that so you don't forget your name? Yeah, I think uh, it's, I, I deliberately do it that way. It's the wrong way around at the minute, I think. So, uh, yeah, it just gives me something to think about. It's a brilliant name, John, mate. Yeah, it's all right. And it's exactly the same name as my dad. Yeah, That's, it's my middle name. Nice. <laughs> nice. Hey, if I, give people, if I give people my bank details, they can take some money out of my account. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They can take it out of yours, put it in the mine if they want. <laughs> Mate, they'll have a job. <laughs> <laughs> so john it's absolutely wonderful mate to get you on the show yeah um in no particular order so first off we've got my very dear friend andy coombs who support his um we're in he's in my life coaching group on um facebook right. and he's a very powerful contributor he's always off taking himself off camping and i just get so envious um um envious of his uh, activities so andy massive love to you mate and massive thank you and to arlene your wife who who contacted me after andy said uh, give chris a mail and she said john has skydived over everest um which just massively piqued my interest having done a bit of skydiving um absolutely loved it everest is kind of one of my dreams i'm sure it's an utterly beautiful part of the world i've never quite been that far john has been as far as um been as far as uh india nice. um, and you've skydived twice over everest yes yeah, very, very fortunate. Very fortunate. Not many people get that uh, honour anyway, uh, but uh, to have skydived twice with, with MND, raising the flag for MND awareness, absolute honour. Absolute yes. honour. So motor neuron disease is, uh, from my very limited understanding, apologies, but it's a, 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 a gradual weakening of, of, of the muscles. Yeah, it's... Uh, Basically, the, the muscular system in the body is closing down. Uh, they don't know why it starts or how to stop it. Uh, mainly sporty people get it, hence Doddy Weir. Rob Burrows are two big names in this country at the minute, the rugby players. Uh, Youth van der Vestes and the South African scrum half died of it. 
Stephen Hawking, probably the most famous universally known person to have had it. They don't know how to stop it, Chris. So, they, um, so my body is closing down and there's nothing they can do. So my arms are now gone. All I'm sitting here like this, I've had to swing my arm onto the sofa. I'm sitting on the floor. I can't use my arms and my whole body's going to close down. And what happens, unlike every other neurological disease, uh, motor neuron disease will entomb me in my body. You become entombed. It doesn't affect the brain in general. So I will know everything that's going on. I'll be completely coppice mentis, but I won't be able to move, breathe, talk, anything. I can't. I'll, I won't be able to tell my kids I love them or my wife I love her. It's an absolutely horrific, horrific death sentence. It's classed as the worst diagnosis in the world. John's body is shutting down. Just come and give me a hand. Just, you know what I'm saying? I've lost the use of my arms, so being an ex-world champion powerlifter and firefighter is uh, pretty devastating. Everybody's scared of MND. It's the most life-shortening of all the neurological diseases. People seem to be scared to talk about it. It's like a dirty word, and I don't understand it. So, Mate, what a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've set myself these challenges, Chris, because... You know, I've done a lot in my life, I think. I've had a pretty colourful life. And I've just got to keep going, mate. My, my, my mantra is never give up. You know, I, I don't ever give up. I, I'll never give up. Simple as that. I will keep going. I'll keep beating the beating my chest and banging the drums for MND. Not enough's known about it. Uh, I'm not, I know quite a few people have died a bit tragically myself now. I will keep raising that flag. And our friends at home might... Um or well, some of them at least, or our friends across the uh, the Atlantic might know it better as a ALS. That's right, yeah. ALS, amyotrophic lateral cirrhosis, or, in fact, you might have heard of it as Lou Gehrig's disease, who was a very, very famous baseball player. In fact, one of the most famous ever baseball players who died in the late 30s of it. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's known as those two things in America, but MND everywhere else. Do they know what the connection is with, with sport? They don't. They don't. They 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 think head injuries, trauma, etc. Uh, uh, I follow a, a very uh, switched on doctor in America who is linking it to a basically a compromise of the spinal system. So your 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 CSF basically gets a tiny tear in it. It could be a micro tear that's unnoticeable from an injury, a back or neck injury, and that's where the toxins get in. And without being able to repair that you've got no chance. I mean, it's 100% fatal. Everyone, everyone with it dies. It's 100% fatal. You, got, you get 50% dying in the first year, uh, some within weeks, and you're given two or three years to live. Yes, got you. And, and it was a bit of a surprise, was it not, that um, Stephen Hawking went on as, as long as he did? Well, he, he lasted 55 years. So he's the longest known survivor, believe it or not. But he now people people are sort of like under you know the impression he died of MND. He actually died of pneumonia in the end, Stephen Hawking, because very very unusually his form of MND. There's hundreds of different formats of MND. Everyone has it differently. It affects you know you can start with your diaphragm, so you stop breathing, you know, which is the muscle. Stephen Hawking, for some reason, and I don't know why, it never ever attacked his breathing system. So he, if you if you think back, or if anyone after this um, podcast looks online and watches images of Stephen Hawking, he never had a mask on. A lot of people with MND, you'll see with the masks going in the nose, the, the nippies and the bipaps going in the mouth. He never had to have that. Have you ever heard the rumour that he was a double? <laughs> I've heard I've heard lots of rumours, Chris, and I, believe it or not, over the years I've uh, I've heard lots of quite um. Quite uh, sad jokes and all, but I won't repeat any now. You know, here I am in the same boat, so I better not repeat any, I suppose. <laughs> well, a bit of humour doesn't go amiss, mate, does it? But no, no. Yeah, the, 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 because he had such a prominent part in science. Yeah, and because you know that that's that's really worth a lot to the the elites. You know, these these huge corporations, the big pharmaceutical it kind of was really in their interest to have his voice like support in their narrative. That's, that's where the, the, because I mean, it was, it, it, I mean, he grew to a fairly ripe old age, didn't he? And and it sort of yeah. defied. Yeah. 76. He, he lived to 76. Well, just, I think he just turned 77. And, um, 
I mean, he was a, uh, you know, obviously the Google pioneered his, or was it Microsoft pioneered the voice system that he had. Um, nowadays, what they do is that when you get diagnosed with MND, they, they basically advise you to voice bank. So you go on this bit of software and say about two or 300 phrases into the computer. And then when you lose your voice, which 80% of us do, we lose the ability to talk, breathe, eat, everything. Um, they use your voice on the computer system now. So it's, it's advanced a lot. But yeah, so he was a good advert for Microsoft and Google. I just have to record, Han, can you get his cup of tea? <laughs> <laughs> my mo- most, most said expression in this house. Yeah, um, I think it's called Mr. Angry. Do you remember that Mr. Angry thing when people got you to ring a number and it was Mr. Angry? Yes. Yeah, that's all I recall, mate. Arlene will back me up on that. There used to be that uh, phone number. You, uh, there was a number you could text and it was Ask. like, ask me anything, right? Yeah. So one night, I think I'd had a couple of beers. I thought I'll, I'll, I'll text who is Chris Frule, right? Think, this is the very, very yeah. early days of the internet. This is, um, anyway, whoever it was was quite complimentary. They text back. Um, it was something like, Chris Frew is a, a cute individual with stunning blue eyes. <laughs> Yay! <It's in> there. <laughs> yeah, that makes up for all the put downs I've had by by women over the years. <laughs> yeah, happy days, happy days. <laughs> hey, John, it's Luke. I uh, just wanted to say, firstly, hi. Um, I heard you have a bit of a fight on your hands with uh, motor neuron disease, and um, your lovely. Uh, Lady sent me a message uh, requesting that I just say, hey, what's up? After now I know what you're going through, wanted to take a minute just to say, firstly, what a warrior you are, what an amazing man you are, what a lovely smile and good energy you have, even through your fight. And I uh, just want to say, please, you, you know, use this video or not to uh, help bring awareness to uh, that plight and that, 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 that battle you, you deal with every day. Um, look, man, it's just, just words of encouragement telling you only love your way, my brother. And uh, if I'm lucky enough to see you at some point, you're going to get a big hug whether you like it or not. <laughs> so get over it. Um, that's it, my friend. Stay, uh, stay strong. Be the example that you've been so far and continue to do so because uh, certainly that's what brought my attention to your, uh, your cause. And um, nothing but love your way, bro. Stay strong. So, John, 26 yeah. years as a, a firefighter. Yes. Um, that's quite, you must have seen some stuff in that time. Yeah, one or two things, mate, to be honest. Um, yeah, it opens your eyes. It does open your eyes, mate. It, um, you know, as, as you well know, you know, death's around us. It's everywhere. Mm. Uh, as you well know. Uh, you just got to live with it, haven't you? You've got you to get on with it. I, I, I always found when I'm in uniform, I'm a different person. You know, I think if I was walking down the street now with my kids, with my lads, and I saw someone get run over, I think I'd possibly act react mentally slightly differently i'm not saying i'll, I'll start screaming and shouting like a like a wuss but I'm, i i think i'd pro- possibly react a little bit different to if i was at the fire station and called out to something a lot more gruesome mm. you just switch on don't you? you get into that mode and you, you do your job yeah and humor comes in a lot there in the fire service does it not is that a way of dealing with it oh big time yeah big time humor to, to the point again i couldn't even repeat it you know it, it's Humour is how we get through things, mate. We uh, we will get back. We will make comments which which get us through it. To so you know, without saying too much, and they and that's yeah, that's how you do it. And, and everyone's got their own way, aren't they? Some people go within themselves, um, but as a team, generally, you don't tend to go within yourself because you've got good big characters around you. You know, proper fellas. You you, you tend to just beat it out. You know, we all beat our chests and scream and shout and crack a joke and next cup of tea and on we go sort of thing. Yes. What was it, John, what were you, can you tell us a few memorable incidents? I suppose being a podcast host, I should ask you. What, um, well, what's, what's my parameters? <laughs> oh, mate, it, it, you got a free for all on here. I, I always say to people, to my guests, you've got to remember that a lot of people at home, they've never like been in the military they've never been in the blue light services they they're, yeah, yeah. they're, they're fasc- fascinated to know um a, 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 as i am 
I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple. So, so when I, when I, was, I, was, I was only 21 at the time, I had my breakfast at the station. Got caught to uh, a jumper under the train at Tooting Broadway Underground Train. I was, I was at Tooting at the time. Uh, got called there. Went down there baking hot day. So we had the air ambulance. Obviously, those suicide pits in the middle of the, the tracks there at the underground stations are a little bit tight. So I'm under there with the air ambulance. And really tragically, this woman's daughter, had, um, so this woman had jumped under the train, basically. She's under there. She got dragged along the lines. But where she had jumped and landed by a complete freak, her feet had landed on the rails. And the, the, the God knows how, but the, the wheel of the train had cut all her toes off. Yeah, so I'm under the train there sort of thing and the air ambulance, you know, the hem doctor's saying, do us a favour, you know, uh, pick up her toes. So I'm looking around in the suicide pit with my torch and I'm picking up and I had 10, to- believe it or not, I'm not, this is not, no exaggeration, I had 10 toes in my hands, all that were cut off, all dirt all over them, all, you know, bits of black and all that because it's pretty dirty down there. And I said to him, you know, what, what do you want me to do with these, mate? And he said, look, look, just hold them for a minute because he was obviously working on her because she'd been dragged along the line by the train, which had obviously punctured into her side. Uh, so in the end, you know, it, they took them off me and put them in one of these, you know, these bags to to sort of secure them. I, I very much doubt they were much used to be fair. But the, the, the tragedy of that was that the woman passed away, sadly, afterwards. And um, the sad thing was her daughter had got run over on a zebra crossing the week before. So she's gone and jumped under. So, uh, you know, that's, that's sad. So that was one. And then we had, we had another one where... Like this woman was, uh, you know, these people that have emphysema or COPD, they have the oxygen equipment at home to, to do the breathing. So this old dear, had, um, she was sitting indoors on her oxygen equipment. So she was taking one breath of oxygen, taking the mask away and having a drag of her fag. Well, you know, as you know, like oxygen and heat don't really go very well. So next thing, we've, we're at a massive explosion, blew out windows, 400 400 yards down the road. This was all over the news. Any, anyone listening might remember it. It was off, just off Cromwell Road near, near Kensington. Uh, so basically, we turned up and one of our lads, um, uh, Irish lad, uh, uh, Batsy on the Green Watch, we, we nicknamed him Semtex. I won't tell you why. So I've gone to old uh, Semtex. I've gone, here, come in here, geezer. Come and have a look at this. So we walked in and I'm not joking you, mate. It was like a scene out of I don't know, horror film or something. What had happened? This, this, this explosion had blown her backwards. So she's, her body's sort of landed probably only about 12 foot from the, the machine, even though it blown all the windows out and everything. But uh, she was lying on her back with her sort of feet up, you know, so her knees are, uh, are up sort of thing. And the, the, the explosion had completely seared away the front of her body, so it's all skeleton, right? But she still had her tongue burnt out in, in the mouth of the skeleton. She still had various organs that were just dried out, burnt out in her rib cage. And, and the back of her skin was still intact, even a bit of hair on the back of her head, where that had obviously survived the explosion. And I'm, I'm sort of down like blooming Columbo, like getting in amongst it. And I'm saying, I mean, obviously you're not allowed to touch because of the forensics and what have you. And I'm saying to Semtex, I'm saying, come on, Stevie, get down here, mate. Have a little look at this. And he, he didn't really know what he was doing. He didn't know what to do. So, uh, and, and, and that was, that was a, I mean, graphically wise, that, that one really sticks in me. Yeah, that was incredible. That was, that was one of those ones where you go back and you sort of piece it together if you had not think, you know, George Lucas couldn't have done those effects on that. That was, that was incredible. But I mean, I, I've, had, I've had loads, Chris, to be fair, over the years, loads. You know, when a young, I, in fact, I wouldn't even show you that one because that, that was probably a few that did sort of upset me a bit when a young lad got run over by a tipper lorry. And that, that was, awful to see how the human body tries to keep you alive was was unbelievable this lad you would have thought there was nothing wrong with him when we turned up he was completely under the double axle at the back the double wheels themselves they twisted his whole body twice in the middle so he was like a corkscrew so he, he, he was he was basically a ticking t- he was dead anyway without realizing it um it just snapped his spine and all his internals and everything and then 53 minutes later when we actually lifted the lorry off of him when we turned up he was banging the wheel saying get me out get me out you'd have thought there was nothing wrong with him and then like I say 53 minutes it took us to, to drip him up you know the paramedics and all that because as you know you can't just release someone who's trapped otherwise they'll die anyway of a toxic heart attack so by the time we got him out it was like someone was standing next to him with a track pump a bike track pump and pushing down his whole body his head 
his upper half that was still out of the, you know, that you could see it up from under the wheels, was just like blowing up like a balloon and down again with the pulse. It was absolutely horrific. It was awful. That that one really, really, that, that was one of the few, three times I'd say in the job where I, I went back to the station and thought, oh, that was horrible. I didn't, I didn't like that one, you know, that, that, that was upsetting. And the only reason that was because my sadly my daughter died a few years ago, and that changed my outlook on death. That that changed how I thought about it. I actually looked at those people and thought, "Hang on, they've got a family. They've got a mum and dad are going to get a knock at the door soon." And told, "Look," and as you know, in the military, same thing. Someone's going to get a knock at the door soon, soon, and told that their their loved ones are not coming back. And and when my daughter died, that changed that, mate. So I, it made me think differently about death. Mate, on behalf of myself, and I'm sure of many, many people listening, just massive thank you for your... I, I never thought I'd say... People say this to me all the time about the military, and I'm like, just don't say that, but thank you for your service. I mean, the word yeah. hero gets banded around these days, but what you guys and, and girls do is... Uh, I mean, when... when when someone needs it the most or a family needs it the most, you, 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 you know, you, 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 you're, you're there without question. Oh, I'm getting, yeah. I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Same, same with you again, mate. Same with the military. When people are running out, we're running in, aren't we? It's the same thing. We're running in. We're paid a pittance for what we do. Don't get me wrong. We choose what we do because we love it. We want to help people. And, you know, in the real world, how much is it worth what you did? What, you know, how much is it worth to go in saving people's life? Well, they couldn't pay you enough, could they? Let's be honest, because saving one life is worth more than they could pay me. So I accepted that, me 14 quid an hour or whatever, 1,800 quid a month, which is a pittance. After 26 and a half years, I was on 1,860 quid a month take home. It was pathetic, but I loved the job. I loved helping people. I loved making a difference. And all my brothers and sisters that are still in that job, you know, you know, I think the world of them, you know, because we all have a laugh and yeah, all right, a, a, a lot of percentage at a time, people say we're sitting around the station, but they don't know the training we go to. They, they don't know what we're prepared and ready to do. Mm. It's not a matter of, you know, we're not going to be in fire gear 24 seven, tearing about at breakneck speeds on a fire engine when there isn't a fire. So we go out and we, 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 we visit elderly and, uh, you know, susceptible people and, uh, people that, that need help and put fire alarms up and give them a little bit of advice. We go to school fates. We go and give fire safety briefings and what have you. But when the shit hits the fan, we're there, mate, you know, two o'clock in the morning. We're tearing down the road, putting our lives at risk. We're running in. You know, I'm sure you had many a time where you thought you were genuinely going to die. Three times in that job, I genuinely, literally, my arsehole went and I thought, I'm fucking dead here. Absolutely, I'm dead here. Three times. You know, and, and I can recall them like yesterday. But I loved it. It was part of the job. Mm. My um, my local fire station had an open day the other day. Lovely. And uh, my girlfriend took our lad along and she said, do you know what his favourite part of the whole day was? <laughs> I said, go on. She said, the fireman's axe. <laughs> Right, he's my boy. Loves axes. He wants to be a lumberjack. Oh, hang on. Have we got you on mute? I just let that ring off. Someone's ringing me. One sec, John. Can't hear you. Yeah, I was saying, wasn't I? My my my, my son wants to be a lumberjack when he's older. He's he's just got oh, a brilliant dude. brilliant book all about the history of lum lumberjacks and um. I bought him a, a, a bust his axe the other day. He's only seven. Um, and I broke his axe. I was putting too much. I was using it as a wedge for something and I snapped the handle. So I went up B&Q and bought him a nice, one of these com composite ones, you know, like the fiber, oh, yeah. fi carbon fiber thing, jobbies. That's yes. Yes. Yeah, favorite bit with a fiber guy, was it? Yes, that was it. That was, that's my son, you know, very practical. Yeah, very good. Yeah, good for him. Good for him. And tell us about the powerlifting, mate. Yeah, so I got in, um, yeah, my dad, my dad was a, my dad and one of my older brothers were a little bit of bodybuilders, nothing, uh, you know, not Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or far from it, but I used to do a lot of weight training and what have you. And then um, 
I was, yeah, you know, I was always pretty strong for my, my size. And then one of the lads went, why don't you get into, uh, do something with your strength? You know, you, you're quite strong. And I went, yeah, why not? I've, I had a little think about it. So I went and done a little power, power lifting comp and won it. And then I, I got in with a few mates of mine this way who are like power lifting legends. They're like, you know, some of the best lifters we've ever had in this, in, in this country. And I started training with them and, and it went from there and I won a few world police fire and prison games and world firefighter games and the world's strongest fireman and what have you. So, yeah, I've got a few little titles to my name and I, I quite enjoyed it. You know, I'm going to get the medals all sort of framed for my, for my boys uh, to have on the wall. And I, I had a couple of world records at various games. I mean, there's all different. The thing with powerlifting, like a lot of these sports now, there's all different federations you know, I, I would say the cream of the federations is the IPF, the International Power, Power, Powerlifting Federation. I never won a world championship in that. I'd love to have, but I don't think I took enough gear, to be fair, to win that one. But um, I was only prepared to uh, put so much in me. So you know, I was uh, going to say, did you get on the gear? Because that, that changes things, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've I, I done the gear, Chris. You know, and anyone who, said, anyone who wins titles and said they're not is absolute talking bollocks. You know what I mean? You don't have to um, convince me, Matt. I remember uh, I was in Austria staying with my mate, massively into cycling, and we were watching Lan- Lance Armstrong, it was like his seventh Tour de France win or something. And I said to him, I mentioned the gear, you know, my mate went, no, he's the most tested man in sport. I said, yeah. not absolute nonsense. You, you, you. Yeah. yeah, I remember I did a bit back in the day. And friends at home, I absolutely don't recommend doing this. Well, you do what you do with your life, what you like, just like I've done with mine. But it, the actual body build, I, I'm, I can only speak for myself and I don't want to put anybody down, but it, the bigger you got, the smaller you felt and, yeah. the, and the more like narcissistic you become you're going out in public with all these short sh- and and yeah. it took took a yeah. mate of mine to come up to me and say chris fucking stop doing that shit man so yeah you're a, you're a handsome bloke get down the gym by all means but all this like walking around like a fucking peacock you look a dick and um yeah. it, it was really kind he said that but the thing was john i'll go in the gym and say you're doing like pull downs yeah. I'll have it, I don't know, the six weight down or whatever. Maybe there's a stack of 20. And then there's a trained a bit. I can maybe, you know, nudge it down four or four, five. When I did a bit of gear, I used to get the biggest weight, the dumbbells in the gym, stack it on top of the yeah. weights on the machine, right? In the, like a crisscross pattern. Then I'd get whoever was in the gym to stand on top of it. That's it, yeah. And 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 it and he and it was uh, it's just absolutely um we want yeah. more, don't we keep wanting more? Oh uh, yeah, it was it it yeah, God. I can't speak for people, you know, of other people, and I know people get upset if you if you judge them, and I don't judge people, but I'm talking about myself now. It was just a massive side of my like insecurity coming out. Yeah, you know, I think it's a lot of people. And I, I had, I'm one of them people. I'm a bit spawny, really. I've always had a body that most people would be really just just happy with. I didn't need to do that, you know. Yeah, I was the same. I was quite sort of athletic, but you know, I've gone again. I didn't take a lot of gear. I, I was only ever on small amounts because obviously powerlifting is about body to weight sort of strength. It's not bodybuilding. So I didn't need to balloon up, even though I did get, I was a lump, don't get me wrong, but I only took certain amounts. You know, I, I had mates that were taking shit loads and, you know, that changes your personality and everything. And it don't even just change your body. It changes everything. Yeah. And that's uh, where it goes really horribly peak tongue and people start headbutting walls and killing themselves and crap. Yeah. It's not good. I'm no. physically, physically changed now for life. <laughs> not going to say, <laughs> not going to say how, but it, it, you know, it, it, it's strong old stuff has an effect on you. Oh, yeah. um, I've, I'm going to be honest. I feel sorry 
for the women. And the reason is, is I will openly admit it. When I was doing it, I was deluded. I was just utterly deluded. Yeah. Right? I thought my choices in life were, 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 were fine. The difference is, as a bloke, when you decide to stop it, yeah, you, you, you still look like a bloke. Yeah. You know, but some of these girls are just, ugh. Well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging. I have absolute respect for anybody in any sport, but it's the fact that you can change yourself irreconcilably. Oh, more yeah. Well, when you think about it, you know, it's a male hormone, so it's not going to change other parts of us so much. Obviously, the muscular system, but with women, if they're injecting the male hormone, then their body is 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 almost slowly physically becoming male. They get a deeper voice. They get facial and body hair. They get. I mean, they their clitoris enlarges literally because their body's trying to grow a penis. You know, it's. It's incredible what, what, what steroids do to women. It, it, it devastates their bodies, devastates them. I mean, the East Germans used to, back in the day when the East Germans and the Russians were all uh, accused of doing all the drugs and what have you, what they used to do was they actually used to take the wombs of the, um, and ovaries of the female athletes out so they weren't producing estrogen, the female hormone. Mm. I mean, the, the lengths they went to back then is shocking. That's why they're all built like fellas. Mm. Yes, gosh. Yes, I'm only saying this just in the hope that somebody might listen and take it. But you, you don't when you're young, do you? You do what you want to do and no one can really... You, you think you know everything and no one can tell you anything. Nah, no, nah, you just want to feel good, don't you? Mm. So, mate, let's get on to skydiving yes. over Everest. And I've watched your video. So... Uh, do you want to mention, you, you You mentioned earlier, the companies that were involved in getting you up there? Yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, that's, that is important because without them, I couldn't have done it. Um, and without them, I couldn't have raised a massive amount of awareness for my neuron disease. So it is important. So, the, well, the first company is actually a charity. Uh, again, next regiment uh, involvement. So Pilgrim Bandits is the charity that backed me. Uh, Matt Hellier is the CEO, ex-regiment Matt. Uh, top bloke, very, very good mate of mine. Uh, you know, go to the ends of the world and back for Matt. He made that possible, that trip. He literally single-handed, he made that possible. Uh, so we went out there, a group of vets, there was about 18 of us. So without Pilgrim Bandits, it wouldn't have happened. It's about £130,000 trip in the end. Uh, that said, without Parabellum tactical training, uh, Lee Winter and, and his lovely wife, Olga, they run a very small, uh, exclusive parachute uh, parachuting company, skydiving company, with the help of a good friend of theirs, Flanners, who's a RAF uh, skydive instructor. And he does this. He's one of these. Uh, he works at Bryce, I think. It's either Bryce or Lineham doing the testing for all the equipment. So if they've got to like uh, do the skydiving in with a motorbike, they, they'll make the new harnesses up. And he's one of these, uh, the, the blokes that tests all the equipment for military skydiving off the A400s. He's doing all the new testing with, with uh, Lee with the new A400s. So those people made this possible. And, you know, it it was just inc- it was just incredible, Chris. Never been in a helicopter in my life until then. Yeah, they're quite, uh, quite good fun, aren't they? Cool, aren't they, just? <laughs> yeah, you get a bit spoiled in the Marines because you don't just get to have a trip in a helicopter. You get to jump out of them and do the underwater dunker drills and fly yeah. up the, f- you fly up the valleys in Norway and the pilots just go so low to the ground and the, the, the um, airframes just weaving from side to side. And you, oh, in, right. in that moment, you really feel like I'm a commando. <laughs> it's just, oh, it's just... I'm, I'm in Norway doing an expedition in Norway in two weeks, funnily enough. Oh, uh, go on. T- 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 another t- t- there's a, there's a guy out there called Desmond, something Desmond his name is. I think he used to train SBS. Um, we're going out to his centre and meeting him, and then we're doing, uh, again, some vets and what have you. Um, to a, a couple of terminal firefighters, me and another one, mate of mine, a London Fire Brigade, and a terminal copper. And we're going out there, and we're doing a couple, two and a half days trekking over the mountains down to one of the fjords, and then six days kayaking in the fjord. Um, 
camping up and up the mountain. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, mate, I'll tell you what. Norway is such a stunningly beautiful country, and I've had the privilege of living there, for, I think, off and on for about four years. Oh, lovely. I, yeah, lovely. I lived, I lived on an island for nine months called uh, Freya, yeah. and uh, I chopped fish, chopped salmon in a... Oh, lovely. Chop, iron, uh, crazy enough, I chopped salmon for the Japanese like sushi market, you know? Right, deal. And this island was just, obviously, you had to get a ferry to get to it. So it was all cut off. There was, they're very big on community in Scandinavia. They live in what they call communes, and they have a much more bigger sense of community than we do. Yeah. And yeah. every weekend, we got hammered on moonshine. Oh, refreshing. Yeah. They call it hembrent, which means home, home brewed. Um, yeah. Did some diving up there. Uh, it was just. It was just. I, I lived on the dock. I actually lived like right on the like the harbour pontoon. You know, our, our yeah. I don't know what you call it. It was like a cottage, all in that nice red wood that they have over there. All the buildings are in that red wood, and yeah, I don't. My room just looks straight out over the harbour. If yeah. you went fishing, literally, yeah. you could just go quarter of a click out and pull up these massive cods just just one fish after another not like in the uk where you can go out for eight hours and still come back with nothing it, it, it's just incredible the people were were, were, were wonderful um, yeah massive yeah it's, it, it's, i'm really looking forward to it i mean I was, I was cage diving with the sharks in south africa last month that was something else I mean, again, with my flag in, in, you know, in the old Atlantic Ocean there off hands by, it's, it's just, just living the dream, mate, you know. But, but the sky, the, the sky dive really was the most, that was the icing on the cake, without a doubt. Mm. 23,000 foot, that to strip the helicopter out because that's as high as they can go, um, you know, all the way up there, oxygen, unbelievable, unbelievable. And, and then I literally felt like I could touch Everest. Uh, you got Amadablam there. You're looking at Lotsey, Everest, Amadablam. It's looking up the Kumbu Valley. Beautiful, beautiful, clear blue sky. And then I've got Lee hanging off the back of me. You know, uh, you know, spare uh, a spare limb. You know, so to speak. <laughs> no, he's he's top fella, Lee. And um, just got you know, we've done all the drills. We've done all the training jumps over here. And then when it happened, I mean, I cried. When, when, when I landed, I cried. I mean, Martin was just trying calling me there. Martin was one of the other jumpers. Four of us jumped. So there was me, Martin Compton. Um, I don't know if you know Harry Magar, uh, Buddha Magar, the double amputee Gurkha, who's trying to be the first to climb Everest next year. Oh, uh, OK. No, I'm not familiar with him. Oh, he's a mate of mine. So Harry got uh, his double amputee. We supported him. Uh, he got to Everest Base Camp this year. Uh, first double amputee to trek to base camp ever. Uh, he came back uh, to meet us and then done the jumps with us. And then next year, hopefully, we're going out and trekking to base camp with Harry. And then he's going up with an expert, expert again with uh, ex-regiment boy, um, Gurkha, to climb Everest, to be the first double amputee to summit Everest. Mm. Well, that sort of sounds the sort of thing Nims Die would be involved in, you know, the SBS... Gurkha turned SBS guy has been on the podcast. He was the first, uh, first, well, he wasn't the first. He cl climbed the world's, is it 14 highest peaks in six months? Um, take your time. Yeah, so Nims Dai climbed the world's 14 highest peaks in six months. Knocking yeah. like six and a half years off the off the record. Uh, exactly. The book, yeah. the book he wrote about it is just incredible. I, re I encourage anybody to read. It's a really good, good, good read. And like I said, he was kind enough to come on the podcast. Uh, um, well, I've yes. got another guy you might be interested in for podcast. So again, again, just left the regiment. Funny enough, mm. Krishna Thapper, his name is uh, ex Gurkha. Absolute, absolute legend. Come in, mate. 
give it, give us two seconds, mate. That's right. Cheers. Um, Krishna Thapa, just let, he's, um, he's climbed Everest twice. Kate, in fact, he was the first British serving military person to climb Everest and K2. And he's the one taking Harry, uh, up Everest. He, he, he took the successful, uh, special forces team up Everest a few years back, 2017, mm. I think. Yeah. Uh, all of, all of these, uh, gentlemen, shame yeah. we can't get. Shame we can't get more women on my podcast, and then we've got to do something about that. But yeah, all these gentlemen, mate, please by all means put them in touch. Yeah, yeah, they're all legends, mate. These are they're all good. They're all good. I'm, I'm very honoured to be around these people. Yeah. You know, they're um, they've done a lot for me, and uh, they do a lot for a lot of people. Funny enough, mm. you know, they're what, good people. What was the view like up there then? It must have been stunning, mate. Um, unbelievable. I never. <laughs> It, I literally, I'm not often lost for words, but not to say if I had a pair of binos, I'd have been looking at the blokes climbing up Everest. I was that close. Mm. I felt like I'd just reach out and touch it. It was unbelievable. Absolutely you, unbelievable. You flew into that famous airport near, near is it called Namchi Bazaar? Yeah, Lukla. Yeah, yeah. If you can have a word with, 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 with some of these chaps, that'd be excellent. Yeah, of course I will. Of course I will. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put them in touch with you. And yeah, I'm like always, um, I'm always, I like, I, I like it when military guys have gone on to do, you know, good stuff, benevolent stuff, kind stuff, or, or yeah. adventurous stuff. That's pretty cool too. Yeah, I'm, I'm surrounded by, I'm surrounded, luckily, and and you know, like I say, it's a great honour. I'm surrounded by some great people like that who dedicate their lives to helping other people. To be fair. Mm. You know, so, um, yeah, that'd be great. And John, how can people um, support, support support you? What's the best? What what links can we put below for them? Uh, well, so so my wife, Arlene, and myself, we have an uh, Instagram page and a Facebook page. And it's Cycle Challenge for MND, simply because I cycled from John O'Groats to Land's End couple of years ago again with uh bill pilgrim bandits massive thing it was was all over sky news and everything raising awareness for mnd uh my my eldest son was 14 14 or just turned 15 at the time rode the whole 920 miles on his bike it was incredible it was so if people want to follow us on cycle i'll spell it out because it's a slightly different spelling it's c y c l e c h a l l a n g e the number four MND. So cycle challenge for MND. If you, if, if they can, uh, if they have a look on there, follow it, follow the link and just follow us. We don't, we're not, we're not raised. We don't want money off anyone. We just want people to follow us. See all the stupid things I've done over the last three years since I've been diagnosed. Um, I've done loads of things, done loads of challenges. Uh, still want to do as much as possible. If you've got anyone yourself, Chris, who you know, who's got a challenge. I want to do the sheep dip, funny enough. I want to do the marine sheep dip down in um, Devon, uh, down there. I, w- I want to do that. Mate, you in, you in hard enough. <laughs> uh, literally, mate, I'll, I'll back you up on that one. I'll have to be shoved under there like a torpedo, mate, anyway, with no arms. So they'll have to shove me under. No, you're, you're going cr- to smash that one, mate. I, 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 I can tell that. Yeah, so I, I, I would be willing to do the sheep dip and every time, if they keep pushing me backwards, forwards, you know, that way, however many times I do it, raise awareness of MND or raise money for a charity or something, you know what I mean? It's just, and I'll have loads of the boys and girls, loads of my brothers and sisters down there helping me. John, That's it's it. been an absolutely cracking chat, mate. I thoroughly uh, enjoyed making your acquaintance and uh, discussing the stuff that we have i hope our friends at home got got as as much out of that as i did um, Likewise, mate keep smashing it you know keep smashing it i don't need yeah. to tell you to stay positive because um you don't need me to tell you that and um yeah. i wish you the best yeah. of luck in norway that's you, you're really going to enjoy that and keep us keep us informed mate keep us up to speed with what you're doing of course I will, Chris. I'll, I'll let you know how the Norway goes. Um, I'm out next week, probably camping with Andy, your mate. So uh, 
I'll have a chat with him and yeah, no, I'll keep you updated, mate. Because obviously, any any you know, it helps MMD awareness. And I'll, I'll speak to the lads and I'll put a few of the boys in touch here. There's some real stories to tell there as well. Yeah, please, please do. And um, keep spreading the word, mate. You're doing a cracking job. Yeah, no, I appreciate your time, Chris. Thanks for having me on, mate. I appreciate it. No worries. Stay on the line so I can thank you properly. That just no leaves worries. me to say to everybody at home, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you could like and subscribe and click the notification bell, that will really help us. Um, we'll see you next time.